Good to see everyone this morning. Thank you for being here. As we lift our voices in praise um, and thanksgiving to our Creator, uh, we're going to um, do it one more time by singing a song. We started the sermon series um, two weeks ago. Yeah, it's been two weeks. So did I press the wrong button? Where do I need to push it to? All right, this thing is not working. All right, there we are. There's the sermon title. Ah, Remember this song? Here we go. Turn me down, Dave. New life in Christ, abundant and free. What glory shine, what joys are mine, what wondrous blessings I see. My past with its sin, the searching and strife, forever gone. There's a bright new dawn, for in Christ I have found new life. Good. Thank you. Have you been singing that for the last two weeks? How about the other assignment I gave you was to read through... Romans, right? How'd you do on that? It's only 16 chapters. It takes about an hour. An hour. Refreshing your mind on themes from what some have called the most important book in all of Scripture. Pray with me. Father God, for a few moments, we just want to have your presence right here, speaking to our hearts, touching us with your immense love. Thank you for um, scripture. Thank you for Paul taking the time to um, write it down. Thank you for all the men and women who through the years have taken special attention to preserve and keep and translate your word. And so now we just ask our Holy Spirit to interpret it for us. In Jesus' name, amen. The most important book. And of course... The theme, new life in Christ. When you see that, those four words, what stands out? Christ? Life? How about new? Anybody like the new word? So all words are pretty important. I mean, in may be the most important after Christ. We're looking at the book of Romans, but mostly I wanted you to kind of catch what impact the gospel has in our lives. So, if I were to tell you that um, the end picture is really a great picture, would it make getting to the end more enjoyable? I used the Seahawk game last Sunday as an illustration. If you knew that they were going to win, would it have made all those anxious moments and all of those negative things that happened and all the poor play and, and the cold? I mean, it was zero degrees. Now, I mean, playing football in that kind of weather, but... But my wife and I, we, we watched it together, and, and she couldn't take it any longer, and she left. And, but if you knew that they were going to come out winners, wouldn't that have made all of the other parts of the game more easy to handle? So I would like to read how Romans ends, okay? Before we get to 
chapter 1 or chapter 8. Remember I said that the book is divided into two sections. One is chapters 1 through 7 and the other is chapter 8 to the end. It's about equal, although as I've been listening to it on my walk every morning and um, I've gone through seven times. This takes me two days to get through, but, but seven times, so you know, it should be really fresh on my mind, right? The book of Romans. But if you look at chapter 1 and chapter 8 and could only see some of the frustration and the words and the language and all that, and you don't have the end in mind, it might make it a little more difficult. So we're going to look at the end first. You have your Bibles. We're going to go to the end of Romans. Now, unfortunately, Romans, of all of Paul's letters, Romans has the longest conclusion. It's almost as if the topic matter has been so exciting and so great to get down on paper that he's not quite sure when to end. It's kind of like what they say about pastors who are not quite sure how to land the plane at the end of the sermon. You, you, you know that. And Pastor Doug is really bad with this. But... But I have longer introductions than I do conclusions, just so you know. The conclusion, however, is it begins in chapter 15 of Romans, how Paul is trying to wind down. Now, I just want you to catch the picture because if you know how it ends, it makes all of the rest a little more understandable. Chapter 15, verse 13. I'm just going to read a few verses. You just follow along, just kind of catch this picture. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. Does that not sound like a good conclusion to the story? May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, we talked about Christianese, right? How many of words here would just kind of mm, resonate with the Christian mind, but not so much with the person sitting watching football? I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to, to, to be honest with you. It doesn't always resonate the way even the New International Version translates it. But if you were to go back to the Greek, if you were to go back and look at all these words, guess what? It was the modern words and the modern interpretation and it was the up-to-date rendering of scripture of of what people talked about scripture and what people the way they communicated was the same it's too bad we don't do that now it's too bad we can't have the language so part of us that we could just say hey this is the spiritual concept but it is real life and real words and words that you can understand May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Joy, peace, trust. See those words? So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, power and Holy Spirit and all those terms are Christianese. Now go on, because this is still the conclusion. He's winding down. I am, I myself am convinced, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness. Whoa, 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 wait a second. That's the end, right? Well, Paul's saying this in the present. I am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, complete in knowledge. How many of us want to just stand up today and say we're complete in knowledge? Ah, not so much. And competent to instruct one another. Whoa, that's not what we think about today. Now, maybe someday we'll have an understanding. We'll get to the place where we can talk about it and tell other people. Not so much now. I have written you quite boldly on some points as if to remind you of them again because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. There's some more Christianese, sanctified, right? But now these are the final words that I'm going to use in the conclusion. Therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. 
I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I've said and done, by the power of signs and miracles, through the power of the Spirit. So from Jerusalem all around to, to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. <clears throat> this is the conclusion. Can we just stop? Wouldn't it be nice to say that you are, you are full, you're competent, that you have complete knowledge? Isn't that enough? He couldn't say that at the conclusion of his book if he didn't have the beautiful themes that he's been presenting out there on paper. And of course, as I said a couple weeks ago, he was only able to do this because he took time to go out in the desert. And I ask this important question of you, as I use Lawrence of Arabia as an illustration. I ask this important question of you. Have you had your desert experience? Have you taken the new ideas? Have you taken this new life in Christ concept? Have you tried to mesh it with the way you were raised? Have you walked out into a quiet solitude place and said, Lord, help me to understand this. The children of Israel went out into the desert. Moses, after all of you know, being in Egypt as a prince and everything, he went, spent 40 years in the desert. And then he's led, ready to lead the children of Israel into the desert to get to the promised land. You talk about miracles and stuff that had happened. He needed to have time to take the people out. And, and it could have made it probably in three or four months, that many people. They could have easily made it to the promised land in that amount of time. But no, it took 40 years. Think of the other people, Elijah. Boom, great, marvelous things that God did through him. And what does he do? He goes out into the wilderness. Jesus after he was baptized, went out into the desert for 40 days. I'm not sure I would have liked to have been there, but I would have, well, I'd like to have been with Jesus. But just going out into the desert to be constantly bombarded by the devil, I'm not sure I would have enjoyed that part. But I would have loved to have listened to the way Jesus handled that would have loved to have had all those precious themes. Tim and I were talking about this. All those precious themes of what Jesus and Satan, Lucifer at the time, must have discussed and dialogued in the, sea, in the, in the throne, in and around the throne of God in heaven before Satan was cast out. I would have loved to have had all those, those little themes kind of brought back into that desert experience as Jesus talked to, to Satan and said, do you, do you realize what you've done? Do you realize where your choices have led us? Do you see us as a, as a world dying, hurting, and I've come so that they can have life? I would have, would have been interested and intrigued by the conversation between Jesus and the devil in the desert. So now Paul has been hit on his way to Damascus, and he has seen that Jesus Christ is alive, and what does he do? He goes out into the desert. So I ask again, have you had your desert experience where you've had to take what Jesus has done, and you've had to put it into your life? and make sense of it. It's only after that, that that you could, like Paul, speak boldly for the gospel. It's only after you've had the desert experience that you could see the contrast between the desolate and the full, between the results of sin and the beauty of Christ. And of course, these are the themes that, 
that Paul's able to build on, and I don't think if he hadn't had the desert experience that he would have been able to talk so freely and so openly about God, Jesus, and the gospel. And so he finishes here. Yeah, there's a long list of people that he wants to to talk about, but he finishes with these words. Therefore I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. New life in Christ. I want to just, um, this may not flow like I want to, but I worked on it a little. Can you see that? There's a little too small. See, I've got to realize what, how big the font is. So some would say gospel needs to have a little bit of simple terms to it. So here's, here's an attempt. This is the G part of gospel. You watch how we're going to follow and fill in the gospel. God created us to be with him. That was God's original intention was for relationship. He wants to be with us. Do you agree? <laughs> Isn't that the starting point? He made in the Garden of Eden all these wonderful things, yes, but he made man and woman and he celebrated the Sabbath. I, I mean, he wants to have a relationship. He wants us to be with him. So this is the G. The O, our sins, this is what scripture kind of elaborates on between the covers our sins separate us from God. Have you found that to be true? Not just the fact that you and I commit sins, it's the whole concept of sin, evil, iniquity. It has separated us from God, at least from our view. God's view, it doesn't. Nothing separates us from God. Sins cannot be repaid with good deeds. Hear, hear. How long does it take you in the desert to realize this? That, that if, you, if you make a mistake, oh, I'll make up for it by going and doing something good. How long does it take us to realize that sins cannot be repaid with good deeds? You could see where we could go. Each one of these points could, we could just spend days talking and illustrations bringing them out. P, Paying the price for our sin, Jesus died and rose again. And there's silence in the house of God. And do, do, do you see that God wants to be in a relationship with us? Do you see that sin has separated us from that? Do you see that sins, our individual acts, cannot be balanced on some kind of table with God by doing something good, and that the final payment was done on the cross. Jesus Christ died and rose again. Okay. E, everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. <laughs> everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. Yeah. All right. Finally, life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. Okay, so gospel. Now, I'll be honest with you. I hate recipes. When I make food, and Sue will tell you this, you can never make the same thing twice. What's wrong with you? Uh, that's because I don't follow a recipe. So I'm not always into this simple outline. But it, it summarizes some key themes that are centered around the gospel. Would I, I I'm going to just say, would you allow me to, but you don't get a choice. Uh, Romans chapter 1. I want you to notice how many times the word gospel is used in just the few first verses. Romans chapter 1. This is his introduction. Short, sweet. Paul, verse 1, chapter 1. 
Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for what? The gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Do you see why Seventh-day Adventists value God's word? Do you see where we do? Regarding his son, do you see how we value Jesus? I'm sorry, but it doesn't always come across that we value Jesus, that we place even Jesus on equal par with Scripture. We are so tied to the Bible because it's our sole rule of faith, because it tells us the, the right things to do. It, it tells us about the Sabbath. We, we sometimes focus way too much on just Scripture and not give Jesus equal space. But how did Paul conclude his book his letter he concludes it with these words i am determined chapter 15 of romans we could probably should keep our fingers there because i'm going to go back i will not venture to speak of anything except what christ has accomplished through me okay christ the value of christ regarding his son who as to his human nature was a descendant of David. So here's one of Paul's first comparisons, contrasts. His human nature, he is the son of David, a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God. So he's not only the son of David, he's the son of God. By his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and for his name's sake, we received grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. So, Paul in his introduction uses the word gospel a few times, but throughout the rest of the chapter he uses it a number of times. Verse 9 with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his son. Um, and verse 14, I'm obligated to preach. Verse 15, the gospel also to you in Rome. And then verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. You can't help but read through chapter 1 of Romans and realize how important the gospel is. Now I want you to go to chapter 8 as he begins the second half of his book. Two of the most important themes in the book are discussed. I mean, we know how it's going to end. We know the conclusion. But two of the most important themes are discussed at the beginning of chapter 1, at the beginning of chapter 8. Here we go. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Some have declared Romans chapter 8 as the most important chapter in the Bible. So we have the longest conclusion of any of the books that Paul has written, any of the letters. It just goes on and on and on. We have the most important book, some will say, the book of Romans. And now, verse chapter 8, the most important chapter. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Another comparison, don't you think? Let's see if we can't chart some of this on the screen. There's two points I'd like to have you consider this morning. Number one, life, life. We talk about new life in Christ. Life in Paul's thinking is not breathing life, but quality of life. Is there a difference? Oh, yeah. Because then he could talk about death, too and not mean cessation of breath, in and out, in and out, air exchange, but he could talk about a concept, a quality of life. When he talks about being dead in your sins, he's not talking about you not being able to breathe. It is true that death is the consequence of sin, but when Paul talks about life, he's not talking about breathing in and out life. So when he's talking about eternal life, He's not talking about breathing in and out life sometime down the future with God that's never going to die. 
He's talking about a quality of life that we can enjoy now that we will always have if we stay with Christ. Is it going to be easy to get that point across this morning? Life is not breathing life, but it is quality of life. So that's why Paul can say, I don't know what to choose, whether to die and go home and be with the Lord or whether I should stay alive and minister to you. I just don't know what to choose, like he had a choice. But, um, and he's not talking about just live, the breathing in and out kind of life, although some would say he is. He's not talking about that. He's talking about the quality of life, which was better. And right there at that moment, he felt the quality of his life was going to be in ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ to other people. That brought quality to his life. Does that make any sense? I'm going to ask you this morning, how's the quality of your life? How's the breathing in part? I could care less about that, really. I mean, it's true, I get to go and, and, and visit people who are breathing their last. And it's not always an enjoyable time. But often it is because I know the quality of their life. I know where they stand with Jesus. It is the most precious moment to be with them. We tracking? On the same page? How hard is it to get this point across? You have to keep this in the back of your mind throughout all we're going to read and study about new life in Christ. Because it's going to take a desert experience, perhaps, to take these concepts and actually mesh them with where you've been in your spiritual walk. The second point I'd like to have you consider is this. The gospel is not a concept, idea, or even simple theology. The gospel is a person, Jesus Christ. I'm going to guess that this might be a little harder. I mean, I just already gave you this little recipe, G-O-S-P-E-L, and, and said, here it is. And in a nutshell, it's a concept. What would it take to move a concept into a person? How hard would that be? If you could go back to Romans chapter 1, let's reread a couple of the words, a couple of those verses that used gospel in it. And if you could just think of Jesus, just think of Jesus. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for Jesus. You see? The gospel, Jesus, has been promised beforehand. Isn't, isn't that who the prophets were talking about as coming? They weren't just talking about this concept out here. They were talking about the Messiah that was going to come. And when Jesus stands up and preaches his sermons and when he heals the sick, it's about Jesus. It's not about the miracles. It's not about what he's saying. It's about Jesus. And that's how Paul can finish his book and say, I'm going to talk about what Jesus has done in me. It's about Jesus then, and it's not about my acts or misacts. If the gospel is a person and not a concept, then it might help us to better understand words like, I am not ashamed of the gospel. How, are you, how would you ever be ashamed of a concept, a religious belief? It's, you can see where you could be ashamed if another person's involved in this relationship. And Paul, with boldness, can say, I am not ashamed of Jesus Christ. Now, this is... Um, this might take a little bit of reworking. And you can see why I might need to have us all head to the desert for a time of reflection. 
I have to ask this question. Is there a difference between shame and guilt? Our granddaughter, she's priceless, but this happened years ago, and she's now almost 13. Can you imagine my granddaughter, gorgeous young gal growing up, growing up, and they, they do hit those teenage years, and it's, um, it's just amazing. But when she was a lot smaller, we were um, playing and doing some stuff, and she was in her bedroom very quiet for a while. And when we went in there, um, she had done some overshooting on the paper with some of the colored pens. What was it? What kind of markers were those? Yeah. On the wall and some and caught in the carpet. Yeah. And so, you know, there's dad and mom and grandma and grandpa kind of saying, wait, wait a second. What are we going to do? How are we going to get this out? You know, and she's kind of, you know, she knew she'd done something wrong. But you know what she said? Priceless. I guess I made a poor decision. <laughs> I guess I made a poor decision. Well, she felt shame. But really what she felt at the moment was guilt. In chapter 1, we have Paul saying he's not ashamed. Why? Because I think he saw the gospel as a person, Jesus Christ. And I think he knew his standing in Christ because he had had his desert experience. He had understood that Christ was all in all. And that's why in chapter 8, instead of talking about guilt, he said there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. These two themes, starting both the first half of the book and the second half of the book, have to be understood. Shame, guilt. Does God want us to feel guilty? Is guilt a good motivator? Does guilt get us to do the right things? Does guilt keep us from doing the wrong things? And we could all say, well, yeah, it's, it's helped me in the past. Yeah, I didn't want to get caught. I didn't want to. But ultimately, if the gospel is a person and Jesus came to show us the Father and to tell us that, yes, in fact, we are want to have a relationship with you. In fact, you were made so we could have fellowship together. Then it takes a different perspective on all the things we do, whether we make a bad choice or not. Now the concept of this, there is now no condemnation, is like having a big black cloud over you all the time. where you are constantly feeling that nothing you do will ever get you to measure up to what God expects you to do. And again, you're focusing on actions and deeds instead of focusing on having a friendship with Jesus. And see, what takes and blows the dark cloud away is the power of the Holy Spirit and Christ in you. How's that, Christianese? back to it. But what does that entail? What is it that we have in Christ? It's a great starting point that there's no longer the dark cloud over us. It's a great starting point to think that the Holy Spirit whoosh, blows it away and gets it out of the way through, the, through a relationship with Christ. Not by suddenly saying, oh, I can do that. I can get the victory over that. I don't have to make that choice anymore. No. You fall in love with Jesus. You simply say with open arms, I accept all that you are doing for me. Now, how is it that we are so quick to want to immediately say, well, there's something I have to do. There's something I have to do. Instead of, I just want to get to know Jesus better. And the more time we spend getting to know Jesus, it's a little deeper. 
Now we're going to look at some contrasts, and we won't do it today, but notice some of these. Paul talks about the law of the spirit of life on one hand, and he talks about the law of sin and death. These are in contrast. He's not antinomian. He's not anti-law. He just says, let's focus on the right law. It's the law of the spirit, and it's bringing life versus the law of sin and death. Now, unfortunately, we have used the law, don't do this, don't do that, and it's been like putting a Band-Aid on your heart. Kids, are you listening? It's like taking that Band-Aid and instead of just taking care of the little owie out here, you got to get to the real root of the problem. See, we took a, take a look at what somebody else is doing. Let's talk about other people. It's sure a lot easier. We take what somebody else is doing, their missteps and their choices and their decisions. I made a bad decision. We take all of that and we, and we want to put a quick Band-Aid on it. We just throw the law their direction and say, you do this, keep following, this, do this, and you won't have a problem. But we've missed that sin is inside. It's in our hearts. And the only way it could go is when we accept Jesus as the gospel and say, he wants to live in me. It's the law of the spirit of life. So here's another, con uh, another contrast. What the law was powerless to do, God did by sending his son. Have you read that in Romans before? Has it ever made any sense? I'm asking you this morning, what the law was powerless to do, God did by sending his son. It's, it's a great contrast, and Paul's working this contrast because he's been in the desert. The law might be fully met in us, why? Because he, Jesus, condemned sin in us. How is it that the law is fully met in us? Well, Christ kept the law perfectly. We accept Christ into our lives. We build a relationship with him. Now, I know it's deeper. It's more troublesome. It's harder to grab your hands and arms and legs around it because it's so much easier to take a look at the law and say, oh, I got an owie. Let's get a Band-Aid out. Let's stop doing that. But Jesus took care of the sin problem by dying on the cross. He didn't just die for your boo-boos. We do not live according to the sinful nature. We live according to the Spirit. So you want to talk about new life? Now, I know this is Christianese. Right? What does it look like? We want to know, what does it look like? Well, it looks like Paul's conclusion, where he can commend every single person it seems like he's had touch with in Rome. Um, and he talks about all these great and wonderful pillars that have trusted in Jesus. His personal greetings. He talks about prayer and the importance of prayer throughout his ministry. But ultimately, he concludes with this, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. I think it's really valuable to read the conclusion. It's gonna help us to understand these great contrasts. How Paul can say, I am, no, I am not ashamed of the gospel and how he could say there is now no condemnation. New life in Christ. Abundant and free. What glory shine, what joys are mine. What wonderful blessings I see. My past with its sin, right? Forever gone, there's a bright new dawn. For in Christ, I have found new life. New life in Christ. Pray with me, Father God. You helped Paul to shape and form some really deep thoughts, but you did it in the uh, picture of your son. 
and the importance of spending time with Jesus every day and the importance of, of knowing Jesus and being confident of this hope that is in us, being trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit to live in us, uh, creating us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. Thank you for your word and thank you for new life. In Jesus' name, amen.